は、皆様、ジョンと申します。よろしく。Hi, my name is Nathan Burke. I work as a developer for Newton.com. We're both here to talk to you today about English and standardized tests. Yeah, what he said. Uh, I started working in New York City、uh, several years ago when I was still studying at NYU. I taught at、uh, a Chinese high school,、um, private school program, and at the YWCA of Queens, actually, mostly Korean and, and Chinese students while I was studying those languages. But、uh, my main experience came from living abroad. I lived in Tokyo for three years and、uh, worked with thousands of students at private schools, public schools, business classes. All kinds of programs while I was、uh, writing and, and, and studying. So, yeah.、Uh, after I graduated from college, I went to music conservatory to study the viola. And when I was there, I needed to make a little money, so I got a job initially as an English conversation leader.、Hmm. My job there were, was to lead conversations with students from the conservatory in English. And from there, I sort of branched out and、uh, began to help them with the preparation for the TOEFL exam. I did that for about three years. Sweet. What were some of the challenges that struck you immediately? You、um, yeah, I'll feel that first. De- definitely, when I first started teaching, it would be just communicating, just exchanging information. I mean, it was really, it was really like the Tower of Babel at first, because my first classes were with Korean students. Adults, they didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak one word of Korean. It was, it was madness. It was, it was really difficult. But, you know, we worked through it. We used a lot of gestures. We memorized some basic phrases. And, and gradually it became a lot of fun. So, you know, depending on the level of the students, communication is the first challenge, definitely. Yeah, I would agree with that.、Um, And I was in a little bit more of an informal setting, but、um, I, I definitely agree、mm. that co- initial communication was a difficulty. Yeah.、Um, and, you know, one other difficulty was to sort of keep the conversation in English、mm. during、um, yeah. the conversation that I was leading because yeah, that I was、uh, very often leading a conversation in a group, and、mm. rather than speak English to me or to the other people in the group,、mm-hmm. people generally are ashamed of their ability in English. It's、we'll、just an,、un- it's an yeah. uncomfortable situation. It is. So, it is, it is. so、uh, yeah. Yeah, I really had to work hard to keep everything in English. It was、mm-hmm. almost like, like being a little bit of a taskmaster. It's tricky. Yeah, this is,、um, this is a good question. The, the first thing I would say, definitely, is that any. Foreign student or ESL student that's planning to take the SAT or the GMAT, LSAT,、uh, I have a lot of respect for you because it is very difficult. Those tests demand English ability that challenges even native speakers, the kinds of questions they ask. And、uh, to, to try to take one of those tests with the disadvantage of having to learn English as well, is, I have a lot of respect for that. And,、um, You know, I, I've been through that myself when I was in Japan. I took the,、uh, J- the JLPT, the Nihongo Kente,、uh, which is the official language test there, and it was a struggle. And I took a few other certification tests in Japanese. So believe me, I know it's, it's very hard.、Um, the first thing I would say is that you have to really consider your own goals when you are planning for one of these standardized tests. And、um, understand that passing a test. Is not the same thing as being fluent in a language. You, know, you have to really know what sort of language is on the test because it's very different from daily conversation. You, know, you have to know why you're taking the test and what your own purpose is. Yeah, to、uh, sort of extend upon that, the,、yeah, the two things are very, very different. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.、Uh, for example, the GMAT is going to test your ability to deal with long, complicated sentences that、mm-hmm. are not necessarily. The most naturally written、yeah. things that, that you would find. It's, it's not everyday not language. So,、um, you know, you're, one of the main difficulties is sort of teasing out to sort of find out what is going to be tested within、yeah. the English language on this test、mm-hmm. and to work hard on that particular、mm-hmm. aspect. Yeah. You brought up the GMAT.、Um, what are some things students can do to prepare? What are some things ESL students can do to? Prepare specifically for that test, the GMAT. Oh, well, I, I'll, I'll take yeah, this one. Yeah, why don't you fill that? So, you really have to 
make an honest self-diagnostic of your language abilities before you even begin. Yeah. You know, you know, take the TOEFL, find out where you stand. You know, take the GMAT and you know, and, and find out what your abilities actually are. And that, mm -hmm. that's a good starting off point. And mm -hmm. you know, self knowledge is really the key here. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, if if your basic language ability isn't good, then preparing for a test mm -hmm. might not be the best way to improve that yes. language ability. Actually, so that's true. That's true. So you really have to figure out what's going on and and, mm -hmm. and how to mm -hmm. to approach this goal of taking a test. If yeah. you need to spend two years learning English mm -hmm. in order to even understand the questions on the GMAT, mm -hmm. then you should do that. Yeah. I, yeah, just to add to that, I, I would say honestly that if your level isn't high enough, you really should consider whether you should take the test or not because the GMAT is not a language test. The GMAT is not testing your English language ability. It's testing your reasoning skills, your knowledge of grammar, your math. It's not primarily testing language. So. If you're a very smart person, you have very good reasoning skills, you're good at, at uh, breaking down arguments, and you're good at math, but then you take the GMAT and you get a low score because of low English ability, then the test is not going to be representative of you. It's not going to show what you really can do. So if you find that you're getting 75% of all the verbal questions wrong and you're having no trouble with the math or less trouble with the math, then you should consider whether or not it's a better idea to take a year, you know, and brush up on your on your English ability. Um, there are also some strategies I could get into uh, for each section, just really briefly, in terms of preparation. Uh, the math section is uh, it will be affected by your English language ability. Some people think it's not. Uh, it is, especially the word problems and the the data sufficiency. So one of the things I would practice doing is translating the questions and separating the math from the English. Um, even if you're an advanced speaker, you're still going to be doing math operations using your native language. This is something I found studying Japanese and Chinese. No matter how good you get, I do math in English. That's just, it works faster that way. I wouldn't recommend translation for other parts of the test, but for math, it can be a good idea. Practice doing that. You can practice translating problems or um, do some practice problems and then you know, try to tease out just the pure computation of it. For the CR and RC, these are uh, reading comprehension and, uh, and breaking down arguments analysis. They're not primarily uh, comprehension questions. They're more logic questions. It's, they're focused on the global aspects of a passage or a, sh or a short paragraph. So um, it's okay if you don't know every word. In fact, these questions, they, um, they don't expect you to know every word. They use a lot of very esoteric strange topics, technical topics. They don't expect you to know all of the vocabulary. So if you don't understand a specific word, keep going. Um, one thing I would recommend is looking at the questions if you get confused. And try to prep, we're talking about prep, try to worry about global meanings, which the best way to prep for that is to read newspaper articles, magazine articles. I would recommend going online and reading uh, editorials, something with an opinion. And then going to the comments section and seeing how people are analyzing and breaking down the arguments, looking at the assumptions, looking at uh, strengthening and weakening an argument. This is what you'll get from that. And that'll help with CR and RC. And then finally, for the SC, uh, the sentence corrections, uh, this section will test specific, very obscure and, and difficult rules of, of English grammar. And, and this is a tricky section because some of the things they test are things that high school English teachers and professional writers don't know. They make mistakes. So with this section, um, th that's the bad part about it. But the good part about it is because it tests these esoteric rules, it's actually very vulnerable to just rigorous practice. If you just do a lot of practice questions, you'll start to see the patterns. It's, it's easier to memorize than RC logic, sort of global things where you can infer one way. When you're talking about specific rules, parallelism, use of that, if you do 300, 400 practice questions, which is not fun. But if you do hundreds of practice questions, um, I guarantee when you take the test, there won't be anything you haven't seen. So the best way to practice for the SC is just brute force, do as many as you can. If you are, if you really need to work on your language ability, and perhaps you're not ready to take the standardized test, supposing it's very difficult for you, 
And one thing you may want to consider is how to improve your language ability in an efficient way. Mm -hmm. and generally, in my experience, there have been three things that can help. Mm -hmm. Number one, you're going to want to do a lot of practice. You know, raw number of hours, the mm -hmm. total amount of time that you spend immersed in this language. I mean, there's a reason why they call it immersion. That is definitely going to be reflected in your, in your total language abilities mm -hmm. um, while you prepare. Number two, you're going to want to have your preparation be across a range of different experiences. So not just reading, mm. not just writing, mm. and not just speaking and listening. You're going to want to do all, all three of those things. You're going to want to use your eyes, your mouth, and mm. your ears. Language is it's a thing that, that really crosses all of the senses, and you want to involve as many of them as possible. The third thing is you've got to make it fun. If you're not having a good time, you're probably not going to retain what you're learning. Mm. So anything that you can do to keep yourself interested in what you're doing, be it spicing up some test preparation with watching some television in English, or going online and having a chat with someone mm -hmm. in English, or going into a discussion forum and responding and getting into yeah. an argument yeah. in English, those things yeah. are all going to help. Yeah, those are, those are some very good points. And I would just add that, I, let me separate it into two groups. Let's say you are on the lower end of English ability and you um, are not really ready for the GMAT or the SAT. In that case, I would agree with everything uh, Nate said. Definitely you want to expose yourself to the language as much as possible. Um, in my experience, that helped uh, when I was living in Japan. I didn't know a word of Japanese at first, but um, what I did is I just chatted with random people at stores. I played video games a lot, which helped me learn the characters. Um, these are all things you can do in English. I would recommend um, if you you know if you like video games, if you like going on the internet, if you like movies and TV shows, watch them with subtitles, then watch them without. Um, you know, listening on listening in on conversations, listening to English music, uh, of course, having a, an English weblog. Uh, all of these things are ways to expose yourself to the language and develop all the four basic skills. Now, for people in, in the other category, which is people who have a pretty high English ability level and want to take, the, they, you want to take the GMAT, but you still make some mistakes and you, you're trying to just fill in the blanks and, and get up to the GMAT level, um, then I would say you need to focus your study. And again, consider this, the type of English that's on the test. Um, the GMAT and the SAT, they're not testing speaking ability. You don't need to worry about casual conversation, even though that's what drives people crazy, being able to have a conversation and sound natural. Those are, that's absolutely the, one of the most important things when mastering a language. But it's not on the GMAT or the SAT at all. All you really need for those tests is high-level reading ability and uh, there are essays. There's an essay on the GMAT and the SAT, so you need to be confident in your writing as well. Um, there's no speaking and there's no audio component, which are usually are the hardest parts of a language test. So to work on your reading ability, of course, reading newspapers, magazine articles, practice problems, all of that is great. And doing test practice test questions, of course, great but focus on the type of language that's actually on the test rather than you know, a, a conversation class or, or you know, a speaking tutor. I mean, these are things that are, are gonna have less, less impact. So th that's what I would say for higher level students that feel ready to try the GMAT or SAT or any test, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>